I've been here four times now, and I, I guess it was almost two years ago that I came here for the first time. And um, you know, things have just changed so much, and it's impressive what just a little bit of you know uh, freedom and safety and entrepreneurship can do to a country. Everything's just getting better. It's like it, it's like er all the incentives were wrong before, and people were killing each other, obviously, and things like that, but. Now, like things seem to have aligned themselves towards sort of building together. And that, that, that to me is the most remarkable thing about this is that how quickly everyone just sort of, you know, fell into this building mode. Jimmy, we got you back down here. What is this? Is this trip three or four for you? Trip number four in nice. for, in El Zante too. It's uh, I, I can't believe you have this podcast studio, Mike. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm I'm pretty impressed. This is as good a studio as I've been in, and uh, it's it's pretty impressive. Uh, it's it's all Andy. Uh, <laughs> you know me at all. I'm not technical, so a Andy. Thank you uh, very much. Magic together. Oh, yeah. But now you have a place to, you know, when you come down, you're free to use it. So. Yeah, uh, and uh, it looks like I'm going to I just have to figure out what I'm going to record. But yeah, I mean, th th this is wonderful. And, uh, you know, I, it, to be honest, it's, it's a lot like what I've been seeing in uh, El Salvador. Each time I come back, I'm amazed at the progress that's been made. Um, you know, the last time I was here it was only like four or five months ago. And uh, and now that I'm back, I see all the roads are paved in El Zante. You know, everything looks cleaner. The buildings are nicer. Like just everything is getting better at a very rapid rate. It's uh, it's pretty amazing. It's yeah. amazing. I think in this day and age, because we're used to in the U.S. where yeah. you know it takes some. Um, five years to build a, you know, a bathroom or something. And, <laughs> and here they've like transformed the country in a couple of years. Yeah. Or, or even a few months, just like there's a bike lane in El Zante yeah. now. You could, you could like just ride a bike around and like get from place to place. It, it looks, it looks wonderful. You know, everything's freshly painted. Infrastructure is all getting in there. Like every, they've cleaned up all the garbage. It just, it looks so nice. And it's like, huh, you know, I think I could bring my family down here. You know, like it's, it's getting to that level yeah. where you know it it would feel super safe it's uh no it well and you look statistically it's yeah. it's way safer than the u.s now so <laughs> it's, it, nobody would have believed you if you would have predicted that a few years ago yeah which is crazy i think i think the latest stats i saw was that uh chicago had like 500 murders this year and El Salvador as a country had like 140 or something like that so just the city of chicago is like three or four times more dangerous than all of El Salvador, which is a significantly larger area. Pretty crazy. Yeah. And, I, you know, people always <laughs> think you can't change those things, uh, yeah. but they're showing that, that you can and it's yeah. not rocket science. It's, <laughs> it's really not uh, amazing what a little safety you can do yeah. and like, you know, getting getting the baddies out of the off the streets or whatever. Definitely. Yeah. Well, I, I remember the so my introduction to you, I've never told you this story, <laughs> but was at Le Bitconf in uh, Uruguay in, I think, 2019. Uh -huh. So we had just started the project. I wasn't really familiar with anybody in the, the Bitcoin space. I wasn't on Twitter yet, I, uh -huh. um, but we wanted to go to this conference. And so I brought some of our team members there. And the first person who spoke was Andreas. Uh -huh. And he was... I actually like him mm -hmm. in general, but that day he was just in rare form. I mean, just dropping f bombs and just <laughs> like, and and so then after him, Max Kaiser came on. And he's like kicking things across the stage, and <laughs> my team was like, "What in the world did you like bring us to?" And mm. and then you were the third person, and you you know, with your style resonates much more with <laughs> with how I'm wired. So you just like laid it out, and and it was all very rational, and mm. and so I was like. Okay, but after the first two, I was worried. It's funny because now I've gotten to know Max uh, quite well and and love him and yeah. see that you know his his brilliance and <laughs> and how he brings people into the space through his persona. But I'm more of a like 
you know, academic in my things. And so for, it was kind of a shock to me. To, so so <laughs> yeah. that was that was my introduction. You were the, you were the one that I was like, OK, I, I think we're going to be OK here. <laughs> it's so funny. I, I, I don't even remember what I talked about in 2019. I don't remember. I don't remember what you talked about, but I remember thinking like, OK, there, there's reasonable people in this. Yeah, space, this so. isn't uh, Max or Andreas. That's, yeah. that's great. I, <laughs> it was, uh, it's funny because I, I, I patterned myself uh, after Andreas at least a little bit. But and know, I've. Yeah seen lots of other herbs talk but that one he was i don't know he was upset about i think there'd been recently a release about facebook and uh -huh. what they were how they were spying on people so he was just oh was that the like, nipples one I, I, you know he, he has one talk where he just goes on about nipples or something i, I don't know. think it was that one but he was just like f this f that and i was just like okay. you know my my brought my son with me and he was, i think like 13 or something at that time i was just like <laughs> It was yeah. it was uh, funny, but that was, that was my my introduction to to you uh, being up out there on stage. So well, well was, I appreciate uh, that. I mean, I, I, I guess I made an impression by not being Max or something. <laughs> <laughs> and don't get me wrong, I love Max, but it was uh, it was uh, yeah, just having those two be back to back. I was just like, <laughs> and then you know, then I I you know came to come to find out that, that you were a believer and mm -hmm. that your faith was important to you. And so obviously that resonated for me. And mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. it's been uh, fun then, you know, since then getting to know you over the last few years and mm -hmm. having you make your uh, pilgrimage uh, to El Salvador more frequently. <laughs> yeah. So you yeah. just got to get your family down here. Yeah, definitely have to. Um, and it's crazy because I've been here four times now. And I, I guess it was almost two years ago that I came here for the first time. And um, you know, things have just changed so much. And it's impressive what just a little bit of, you know, uh, freedom and safety and entrepreneurship can do to a country. And it's, um, yeah, it's, uh, it's inspiring to watch you work with this community and, and see sort of like a transform in ways that, I, I'm sure even you didn't imagine like a few years ago. No, it's been shot. Well, it's been, and I always knew that like kind of releasing the animal spirits and mm -hmm. people is, is important for them to feel like they can mm -hmm. build a better future for themselves was important. But huh. I didn't, I underestimated how important we've mm -hmm. seen that here in El Salvador. It's the same people, the same resource, same education level, but now they just feel like there's a future and you mm -hmm. see just how much potential and mm -hmm. resources there are, how much human capital mm -hmm. was being kind of kept down before. Yeah. And not just that, just uh, I, like everything's just getting better. It's like it, it's like er all the incentives were wrong before and people were killing each other, obviously, and things like that. But now, like things seem to have align themselves towards sort of building together and that 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 to me is the most remarkable thing about this is that how quickly everyone just sort of you know fell into this building mode uh, i think it was like sort of a destruction mode there for a while and um that that was unfortunate but like turning it around like uh like that same level of that that same velocity going downward now now it's going on the in the other direction and it's, it's brilliant to see yeah yeah so just for for the the viewers of people i'm sure most people are familiar with you and your mm -hmm. story but would love to you lay out a little bit of your background and mm -hmm. how you came in to bitcoin and how you see the intersection of bitcoin and your christian faith yeah yeah so i mean i'm a I, I've been a believer and a coder for roughly about the same amount of time. I think they, they both came into my life right around the age of eight or nine. Um, and, you know, I, I've, um, you know, I, I, I was a recent immigrant in the United States. And, uh, so so you weren't born in the U.S.? No, no, I was okay. born in Korea. And, uh, and my dad uh, was stationed in New York because he worked for a textile manufacturer in Korea. Um, and... At the time, that's where a lot of clothing was uh, was made. But all the fashion designers are like in New York or whatever. So they needed to have an office in New York so he can show them, hey, like we can make these kinds of clothes or whatever. So he was the sole representative for his company in New York. And uh, I, I don't know how he got that position or whatever, but he knew a good thing when he saw it. And he decided, OK, we're, we're immigrating and he was originally supposed to uh, stay for three years. Um, they extended it to five. And after five, they told him to come back home. And he said, I quit. 
And by then oh, we really? had, a, yeah, by, by then we had a green card. Five years is sort of the limit. So uh -huh. he had a green card. That meant all of us had a green card. So uh, we continued and, um, and yeah, I, but I, I got into coding fairly early, partly because I was in the United States and yeah, I didn't, I, I played with a computer in the back of the classroom, like the first day I remember, and I was like, what is this machine? And it was, it was a pet computer in the back of my third grade classroom. And yet it, it was the kind where you had to like insert a cassette tape to load a program, right? Like that's how old it was. It wasn't even like the five and a quarter inch floppy disk or the yeah, three and yeah. a half or anything. It was, it was a tape drive. And, uh, and, you know, I, I was like, okay, what, what, what's on this tape that lets you get this thing on, onto the screen and, you know, there, there are all sorts of programs and stuff like that. And I, I just, it, it captured my imagination very early. And even though I couldn't really speak English, I was just like, all right, like I, I want to be on that thing. And anytime there was an English class, I was, I, I was back there and I had my own training, like doing with the ESL teacher and so on. But I got, I got into it fairly early. Um, I, I eventually begged my dad to get me a computer um, at home. And at the time, there weren't that many computers available that were affordable. Yeah. Uh, the, the one that we found was a Toys R Us, and it was a Commodore 16, which uh, if, if, you're, if you're a child of the 80s, you remember... Was it 16 or 64? The 64 had the great games. Uh, okay. The 16 had nothing. We had the 64, <laughs> I think. Yeah, the 64 was amazing because <laughs> you had like, uh, you know, 50, 60 games and then the 128 came out later and like, I think Amigas had the ability to play some of the older games or something like that. But the 16 literally had a cartridge insert at the back for like three games. And, and that was it. And one of them was Jack Attack, which came with the computer. And the other two were text adventures. And I didn't understand it because I was an, a recent immigrant. I'm like, what? What is this? I I don't know what to do, right? Like I couldn't figure out anything about the game. And the only other thing you could do with that computer was to program it. It had Line Basic and uh, it had a Line Basic interpreter. So I started like making, trying to make stuff. And my mom saw that and she enrolled me on Saturday afternoon computer classes where they really didn't teach you that much, but. Okay, I at least learned this go to command, so I can I can like, at least do some stuff. Um, and eventually, my mom found like some other teacher that could show me, hey, here's how you actually do programming, and here's how you use variables and things like that. Um, eventually, I ended up uh, you know taking a lot of computer science classes in high school, um, and all all along the way, you know my my faith journey I think was was similar in that. Uh, I went to a camp in upstate New York when I was nine years old. It was called Word of Life. Um, and, you know, it's funny because I've talked to Jordan about this. Yeah. He, 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 his, like, he grew up near there and his parents were really involved in that ministry. I don't but, know if you've met Valentin yet. Uh -huh. He's the missionary who's, who's in Peru that's, that's doing uh -huh. the motive project. He, I think, came to, to Christ from a word, word of life, life camp, camp yeah. in, in upstate New York. Yeah. No, no, in Romania. His, oh, in Rom was, his was in <laughs> Romania. <laughs> yeah. So, so. That, that, that was, uh, that was, you know, I went, I went there like every summer. It was like a big part of my life. And, uh, you know, it, like similar to the computer programming, it like really ramped up in high school where, you know, I was taking computer science classes. My dad had uh, purchased like a 486, 33 megahertz. I still remember that computer was like super fast. And, you know, um, had, had all kind, of, and I was, you know, using Pascal to program all kinds of stuff. Um, and you know, high school was also when I um, when I got really involved in my youth group, and um, yeah, it, it was it was it was a big part of my life. Um, so when I finally graduated college and started doing, and, and did you go to school in New York too? No, no, I went to school at Michigan. Okay. So, um, so that so four years there, I was a math major there, so I didn't really program there, but I was pretty involved in my fellowship. Um, but after that, uh, you know, I went to a startup uh, and I, I did startups for like 13 years as a programmer. They're always in demand amongst startups or whatever. So I, I went to Cambridge um, 
because uh, my high school friend had graduated from Harvard and he wanted to hire me because he remembered me from high school. And this was during the dot-com boom. So the, the, it was like sort of a decent time to get in, I guess. Um, was that like late Late 90s? 90s, yeah. So uh, so I was there for a while and I, I just did startup after startup after that. Uh, and it was in 2011 that I really... Uh, I, I was working at yet another startup, and I think I was one of the co-founders for a three-person startup. And uh, and I ran across a slash dot article that says, uh, "Internet-only currency Bitcoin reaches dollar parity," and it was spelled with a big B and a big C, Bitcoin, like camel case, um, which was very like that. You could tell that's how early it was because yeah. no one spells it that way anymore. Um, but that 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 was when I first saw it, and uh, and this was February of 2011, so like 12 and a half years ago. Right? And I, I saw it, and I remember like just digging into it because I, I had no idea what this was. And and then as soon as I saw that it had a 21 million limit, I was like, okay, I, I need I, I need some of this because it's it's scarce. And that, that was 2011, uh, and you know I, I eventually got into the coding aspect like a couple of years later, uh, and this was during sort of the second bull run of 2013. So 2011, mm -hmm. what, where could you purchase Bitcoin at that time? What was the, so, the process? Uh, so you could purchase it at Mt. Gox, pretty okay. much. There, there was another exchange in the US, but you had to actually like physically send them a check. Like they wouldn't take any other form of payment. And like, it would take like weeks to clear, but they had like a big discount compared to everybody else. Cause it, it was so painful, but I, I didn't even know about that one. Uh, so it, it was that, and there was, there was some like loophole through second life where you can get Linden dollars and then convert that to Bitcoin somehow. I, I couldn't figure that one out either. Um, there was, there were two other exchanges that came a little later, but the main one was Mt. Gox. Okay. And, uh, and at the time, like they're an exchange out of Japan. So what you had to do was you had to open um, uh, an account with a money transmitter called Dwala. So like you had to open an account there, then you had to like check for their two deposits to your bank account and then verify it. And then after that, then you can link it to like an account that you open on Mt. Gox. And then after that, then you can transfer money and then you can uh, to Dwala and then you can transfer money from Dwala all the way over to Mt. Gox. It, it was a painful process and I got started on it. I Well, first I tried to mine it and of course I couldn't. Um, but then I, I tried to like start it and it was just too painful. So I, I just kind of gave up on it like halfway through it. Like, yeah, it's, it's going to take another yeah. two weeks to like do whatever. So, um, you know, it, was, it wasn't until that summer when uh, Bitcoin had its first pump. So it went from about a dollar all the way up to 30. And then it dropped all the way down to two. So it, that was like, if you think like, uh, you know, the pumps now are, or it's crazy volatile now. You 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 see nothing because like that that thirty dollar pump was crazy. And like if you were paying attention at all, it was just kind of wait. It's eight. Wait. It's ten. It's fifteen. It's twenty dollars. And, and there was people that time were had bought at like five cents or ten yeah, cents. I mean, there 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 were people that had bought that early. Uh, most people I, I feel like came in around the dollar or so. So okay. Uh, but I mean, it, it was kind of crazy. It made, made the front page of Wired, and I was like, okay. All right. And then it, it crashed, and I was like, all right. You know what? I I'm halfway set up with this thing. I'm I'm finally gonna have to like go get some or whatever. So that that's that's when I first got into it was 2011. Uh, but I didn't actually start coding in it until 2013, and that was uh, after the first pump to 266. There was a big crash because Mt. Gox was just super slow. I still remember that day. It was just everyone's watching and it's going from 200 to 220 to 240 and 260. And then Mt. Gox crashes and like, like nobody can trade. And then as soon, uh, like, it's like three hours of just like, what's going to happen or whatever. And then all of a sudden it like comes back online and just drops like a stone to like down to $50 or something like that in, in like less than a day. 
right? Like that. That's that's how volatile things were back then. Uh, but that that um, that winter, I think I think it was almost exactly like uh, twelve years ago. That that or ten years ago. It was uh, November of twenty thirteen. Was when um, wh- was when it was uh, sort of like going up, and it was like a six week period when it went from like a hundred dollars to eleven hundred. It was cra- crazy times, right? And uh, and that was after Ross Elbrick's arrest, and I, I, I and I was uh, looking for ways to earn Bitcoin because I didn't want to pay for it or whatever. So I was like, okay, how, how do I how do I earn Bitcoin? And there was a subreddit called Jobs for Bitcoin. And back then it wasn't Twitter, it wasn't Bitcoin talk like it was in 2011. It was uh, there, there was a period of a few years where all of the activity was on the Bitcoin subreddit, our Bitcoin. And uh, I saw that there was a subreddit that they were promoting Jobs for Bitcoin. All right, we need to get a circular economy going. So let's 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 do jobs for Bitcoin. And most of most of the like posts on there were like kind of junk, right? Yeah. I I will critique your article for whatever, and it's like okay, it's people trying to earn Bitcoin. Yeah. But there was one post which said Python programmer wanted, and like most of them are selling services. This one was like I'm willing to pay Bitcoin. Was one of the few that that did that, so immediately interested. So you were you were keyed into the importance of the circular Bitcoin <laughs> even back then. Like well, that, I mean, was, that, that, that was sort of the yeah. narrative back then, uh, especially with like the dark net and stuff like that, um, like being being sort of the black market currency and so on. So, uh, but yeah, I saw it and I was like, I I messaged the guy on Reddit. Turned out to be a guy from Ukraine. And he had a uh, Bitcoin-based project called Color Coins, and he wanted some programmers so he can make the open source project like completed. Basically, he'd been working on it since March or something. Uh, I found out later that he had earned a bunch by like implementing a very basic version back in March, like a few hundred at that point. So he was like, "Okay, you know, I can I can spend some of this." And Bitcoin price was going up, and he was like, "Okay, I need to." like complete this project. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I think there were like seven, eight people that, uh, you know, queried him about like uh, doing some work. And he's like, okay, well, here's some work and I'm going to divvy it up. And what's going to happen is, you know, like when, you, when you're when you done, let me know and I will pay you however many hours you worked on it. So I received my first assignment. I think I completed it in like two or three hours and I sent it back and I was like, okay, here, here, here you go. And he was like, wow, you're really fast. How much do I owe you? And I was like, this, uh, this much, here's my address. And he sent it. And that's, I think like a big light bulb moment yeah. for me. Cause here's a guy in Ukraine and here I am in, uh, in Austin, Texas. And he just sent me money. Right, like I didn't have to do anything, and I was like, "This is awesome!" And so I, I that that sort of like triggered like forty hour work weeks for like the next uh, next couple of months uh, with him, with him, okay. uh, because uh, I, I turned out to be the most productive developer on that project just because I was so motivated. Like when Bitcoin price is going up, you want to earn yeah. Bitcoin, so. I, I I did that and uh, you know basically learned all of this stuff about Bitcoin, right? Like, okay, here's what an HD wall. Here's what, so I got a lot. Uh, I got education just from having uh, like a job based on it. So that 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 was how I got into it. Was uh, the development work uh-huh. that you were doing was mm-hmm. it? Was it just kind of general that was non-specific to Bitcoin, or did it have? No, no, it was a, it was a were... it was a color coin Bitcoin uh, like color coins wallet. Okay. So I had to Im- I had to do a lot of stuff that's like wallet based, and um, you know how how to like issue a token and stuff like that. Like all all this like talk about ordinals or BRC twenty or whatever. We did this back in twenty thirteen, guys. Like <laughs> it's it's nothing new. Uh, and and we 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 were programming it and okay like you can issue an asset you just have to color certain bitcoins as one thing or another and you can you can mark it and so on and uh, you can go back to the issuing transaction and all that so so we we made this thing and uh, we more or less completed it uh, we needed like uh, 
a uh, white paper written for it. That, that was sort of the thing that you did at the time. And we wanted to present it to the world. So we hired this guy, a um, pretty good writer, uh, to write our white paper. He wrote our white paper and it was nothing that we implemented. So we're like, what, what, what is, what's, up, what's up with this guy? What, what is this guy doing? And, uh, and uh, he, Well, that was, that was the trend. The, the, yeah. You guys set the trend there too. Well, so we, 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 we asked uh, uh, like him to change it. And he's like, no. I, I don't think I'm going to change it. I'm like, the, then we can't pay you. And he's like, no, no, I, I, I have some, I have some other ideas that I want to explore, and I want to kind of launch my own token anyway. I was like, oh, uh, okay, <laughs> all right. I, I guess you're, we're going to part ways. Um, and that that was uh, that was of course Vitalik Buterin and that coin oh, was really? Ethereum. Yeah. So that 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 was uh, that was back in November of 2013. He released the Ethereum yellow paper, uh, white paper, and yellow paper in January of 2014. I did so, not know that history. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. No. I mean, I, so I I kind of he, he was a 19 year old yeah. uh, from Canada at the time, right? So it was just sort of like I I I knew or like. I knew what he was trying to do, and I uh, I knew right away that it was a disaster waiting to happen. Um, just how much of a disaster we we still don't fully know because it's it's still kind of like uh, the fallout from that is still ongoing. But that 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 was uh, that was 2013, and okay. that 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 was my first introduction and, into and, COVID. And that, I mean, that was way before I was uh -huh. was in mm -hmm. the space. Mm -hmm. What happened with color coins? Did it ever? Did it just kind it's of? It's still around. Okay. I mean, you could. And there, the thing is, like, uh, it, there ended up being like five different implementations of color coins, and like there, there were multiple altcoins launched even back then. Uh, so the I, I found out later, the guy from Ukraine that hired me did so in part because there was another project in July of 2013 that started, and it was called Mastercoin. Now. Mastercoin is not around anymore. In fact, they had to rebrand to something called Omni, and it's still a coin that's around. But uh, but that that was uh, sort of like funding a color coins project on top of Bitcoin by using uh, you know by using this like idea of a token sale, what you would call an ICO now. Um, and that that was sort of like uh, started at that time. And the reason why he wanted he was willing to pay developers to work on his uh, open source project was because they got they raised five thousand Bitcoin July of 2013 to for that project, and they were paying out bounties for all kinds of stuff. And uh, and one of the things I realized at that time, uh, like some uh, like uh, towards towards the end of 2013, was that okay if you if you pay for development it's not going to be very good quality so they one of one of the bounties that they had back then was a block explorer for mastercoin and you would think it's a relatively simple concept except like the guy that designed it didn't know what he was doing is just kind of technically kind of inept or whatever and uh and all four there were four submitted like projects to earn a bounty and all for a particular address, all four show different balances, which is like, okay, something is seriously wrong if you can't agree on a balance. And that that sort of like bounty paradigm, like I like hi, hiring devs to kind of do it that way, it just it just didn't work. Um, and that that was part of why he was willing to hire people, uh, and that I, I was uh, I was a fortunate beneficiary of that. But that that color coins project actually still exists, and okay. uh, I think that repository is still out there. We we like issued like tokens and stuff like that. No nobody was interested because we didn't have any marketing budget behind it. Um, you you know Vitalik obviously took that and took it sort of to the next level. We thought it was going to be like. Okay, like shares of a company or something like that. It ended up being okay. Let's uh, let's have a platform for raising money from stupid people, right? Like that. That ended up being sort of the main use case that that Vitalik found. So, um, but yeah, that that was my introduction into it. And uh, you know, by that uh, by the end of 2013, early 2014, I realized okay, I, I have to do this uh, kind of permanently because I I have. No desire to code almost anything else, and uh, 
And yeah, I, I worked for a few other Bitcoin startups. So went to a company called Monitas and they were trying to incorporate some other sort of uh, digital asset tracking system that was like federated and all this other. And I never really quite understood it. Uh, but, you know, they wanted some color coins integration or whatever. And then uh, I, I moved on from them to Armory, which was uh, uh, an early Bitcoin wallet, very secure wallet. Uh, and, and when we ran out of money there, we, I went to Paxos, uh, which uh, like some of the OGs here might know as uh, ItBit. You know, that was like an early exchange as well. So, but, but yeah, I mean, my, my journey has been mostly around um, you know, being sort of like a startup guy and, you know, being a quick coder, um, and, you know, just sort of learning on the job as, as a lot of coders do. <laughs> um, but yeah, it, it really didn't come to a head until I left Paxos and that was, um, that was summer of 2017. And like at the beginning of 2017, I had less than 200 Twitter followers. And by the end of 2017, I had 90,000. Was Bitcoin Twitter a thing then? Yeah, was yeah. That, by, okay. by 2017, okay. uh, 2016, 2017, it definitely was. And there was, a, there was a big controversy right around 2015, 2016 uh, with uh, this guy, Thamos. He was banning people off of Bitcoin talk and he also controlled the R Bitcoin subreddit. So people started going where they weren't going to get censored, and that ended up being Twitter. Um, and that that was where a lot of people were, uh, and that that was where I, um, you know, I, I started writing to explain some stuff, and you know, I I, I had like less than two hundred followers, and then my writing got uh, caught on with some technical people and started getting recommended and I started going on YouTube shows. And next thing I know, it's like, okay, like people actually know who I am, which was weird by the way. And I, I'm sure you can relate to this experience where like people start recognize you at the conferences and stuff. So it, it was, it was, it was, it was, it was a little bit weird for me. Uh, but, I, but I still remember um, going to, I think it was the uh, it was the second conference where I was invited as a speaker, and that that whole experience was uh, kind of strange to me that people would like pay to hear me speak. Uh, but but one one of the people I met there was uh, well, so, so there were a bunch of people at sort of asking me questions about Bitcoin. I guess they. You know, it, it, it's kind of what you do at a conference or whatever. And uh, and one of them asked me, okay, like, how, how do you, like, balance all of this stuff? Because uh, I, I mentioned that I had six kids and, you know, I'm I'm coding and doing, uh, running classes and all this other stuff. And I was like, okay, well, you know, like, I've learned to just prioritize my life. And I only have, like, really four things in my life that i prioritize and if it's it, if it doesn't fall into one of these four buckets then i don't do it right so and they all start with f so it's easy for me to remember but it's my faith my family my finances and why can't i and my fitness right like th those are those are it and if if it doesn't fall in and so somebody picked up on that and he was like hey i'm a man of faith as well and i realized okay there's something about this that there there's uh there are Christians in this space mm -hmm. and and if I just mention it right they they'll come out of the woodwork and that that was sort of like the first experience with that uh, later on I met um, George McHale who's uh, Russell Kung's brother-in-law mm -hmm. he was organizing the conference that Russell was putting together um, and. I was invited to that conference to speak um, and I got to talking with him and he was telling me that he used to be a pastor. I was like, really? And we started talking about that stuff and we kept the dialogue going after that conference. And um, and you know, I, he he's a little bit more progressive than I am, I guess, theologically. Um, but we, we kept the dialogue going and uh, at a certain point, we decided to do like a Bible study. 
right? Let's let's look at all the places where the Bible mentions money. See if we can learn something. And there was one other guy. And what, what year was this? This was uh, twenty twenty early twenty nineteen was okay. when I when I met him, and and we started talking about it. Um, uh, and I think it was like uh, maybe that summer or winter when we started like doing a Bible study. Um, and each of us would bring like a passage and say, okay, like let's meet like every other week or something. And we'll, we'll go over the passage and, you know, see if we can learn something and get gain insight. It turns out there's a lot of passages on money in the Bible. And there's, there's a lot of insight you can get if you understand money a little bit. Um, so the other two guys in that Bible study, George was a former pastor. The other guy was like a current pastor. Um, like after that Bible study ended, they they both were uh, wanting to learn more about the economic aspect. They realized like uh, they they knew scripture. And were they both Bitcoiners? Also? Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. They they realized they they understood uh, scripture pretty well, but the part that they didn't understand, which uh, which they wanted, which uh, was sort of like an economic understanding of money, because that that's sort of like necessary yeah. to really unpack a lot of. I mean, that's what brought me into Bitcoin. I was, <laughs> yeah. a, I was an economics major. Uh, uh, that that was. I'm definitely not coming from the tech side. Uh -huh. It's more from the monetary policy and the like, separating money from state. Yeah, so. and uh, and that that's. Uh, I, I think the experience of a lot of people. So they they wanted that, and I was like, okay, you know, there there's a book I read like maybe a couple years ago. That was very enlightening in that regard. And it was The Ethics of Money Pro Production. It was by your Guido Halsman, I think. And, uh, and he's an Austrian economist, but also a Catholic guy. And, uh, and that, that book is really talking about morality. And you really can't get morality without talking about God in some way. And so he, he traces like the, the thought, uh, sort of the intellectual thought around money and money production. And it's almost all done by Catholic monks and stuff like that. And they, they, they had all of these writings. Um, in particular, the, the one that impressed me the most was Nicola Oresme. And, you know, he's quoted in our book, uh, Thank God for Bitcoin. But, you know, this was a 13th century French bishop who recognize that early okay like if the prince like creates more money he's stealing from everybody that's what he's doing 13th century he's all he's like being a math major he's he's also somebody that uh that that was the discoverer of the fact that the harmonic series diverges but that's like something that you wouldn't understand unless you're a math major but you you know how significant that is and not intuitive at all but um but he he he's a absolutely brilliant like sort of like Renaissance uh, uh, man I guess before you know before the Renaissance but that you know he traces people like that all through the book uh, and uh, and so I was like all right let's let's study this book you know, and this will give you a good deep uh, sort of like ethical understanding with through a you know Christian lens. Um, and I was like, um, you know, and you know, let's invite some people to see, see if anyone's interested. And that was like early 2020, and uh, and we invited a bunch of people and uh, just like Christians that we knew in the Bitcoin space, and it became sort of our Bible study. And of course, COVID hits right around that. Was time. this all done online? Yeah, so, yeah. yeah. So okay. it, the COVID hits around that time, so all of us are not able to go to Bible study. So we're like, okay, this became like the event for most of us to like actually talk about God in any reasonable context. So, uh, and we, we had like 10, 12 people show up every week. Um, and we, we kept that whole thing going one chapter a week. Um, and you know, it's, it's a, it's a fairly long book, but we, we got through the whole thing by the end of it, we had heard about another book that was kind of similar. Uh, Honest Money by Gary North. And uh, Gary North is a uh, Christian. He was a staffer to Ron Paul, but he's also an Austrian economist. And he's uh, he calls himself a Christian economist. And I'm pretty sure that's from C.S. Lewis, by the way. But uh, but he, he, he wrote a whole ton on the Federal Reserve, um, you know, what, what honest money ought to be, fair, fair uh, balances and stuff like that. And he wrote this book for Christians. So we started studying it. And we 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 had a great time studying that too. So by the uh, by the summer of 2020, we had finished both books, 
And we really enjoyed sort of like our, our time together, just like, um, you know, studying this stuff as Bitcoiners. Uh, so at the, at the end of it, uh, you know, I, I was like, okay, what, what, what should we do next? And then I was like, do you guys want to write a book? <laughs> They're like, yeah, sure. I, you know, I, I used this process for the little Bitcoin book that, a year earlier with uh, Alex Gladstein and a bunch of people from HRF. So I was like, you know, we could we could just try it. It's, I mean, it's not going to be quite as intense or whatever, but we'll we can we can meet and you know, it's it's a it's a little bit of a lab, laborious process, but I think we can write something better than these two books because they don't incorporate Bitcoin at all. Um, and they they were you know, God bless them, pretty game about it. And we uh, we had eight people um, that were the most consistent people that were showing up to our. Bible study uh, or our book study, and those eight people, you know, ended up being the people that wrote the book, and I think we published it towards the end of the year. Um, and did you like yeah. divide it up and have certain people write certain chapters, or how, I mean, you guys did a good job of unifying it, so it didn't feel like a bunch of different uh, yeah. voices. How yeah. did you achieve that? Yeah, so uh, so there's this process that I came up with, uh, like uh, from a year earlier. So when when we wrote the little Bitcoin book, um, you know, I, that's something that I've wanted to try because a year before that, um, I, I was at uh, an O'Reilly kind of retreat thing, uh, and O'Reilly is the publisher of my first book, uh, Programming Bitcoin. And I was talking to a bunch of authors there about how long it takes to write a book. And most of them were like, yeah, it takes like two years. <laughs> uh, so you're, you know, I, I was like lamenting the fact that I had already taken nine months and I wasn't that far into the book. And they were like, oh, don't worry about it. So it, it takes like two years. And one guy's like, yeah, it took me seven to write this one. I'm like, okay, like, I don't want to be sitting on, I, I don't want to be like G George R. R. Martin or whatever and like not, not publish a book that's being anticipated for 15 years or something. But uh, but there was one guy that was uh, that had this little workshop that said how to write a book in a week. And I was like, what? So I, I went to that and he introduced me to this concept of book sprints, of like writing a book in a week. And um, you know, some some of the sort of hints at like how to do it and stuff. And I had done stuff like that before, you know, having been at a lot of startups, you, you do coding sprints and design sprints and things like that. So I was like, okay, let's, uh, let, let, let me just see if I can do it. And I, I had pitched Alex Gladstein on this because he, he wanted to write a book um, and he wanted me to be the sort of like the technical reviewer. I was like, scrap that, let's, let's just write a book together and I think we could get it out in a week. And he was like, all right, I'm game for it. And he organized a bunch of it. We, uh, he, he found uh, a, a house in uh, California with like nine bedrooms, each with its own bathroom or something, some mansion or something. And we basically uh, all, uh, you know, went there for five days and I carried out this process where, you know, you identify your audience, you identify, uh, you write the review, the Amazon review you want them to write, and then you write down a bunch of ideas to get them from point A to point B, organize those ideas into chapters, then you label the chapters, then you make like a path through the chapters that makes the most sense for the user. And then, and then we just started writing, you know, everyone take, take a chapter and try to write it. And then you swap and then you edit and, and everyone touches every chapter, yeah. which is which is what we did with the little Bitcoin book. And we did the same thing for Thank God for Bitcoin. But instead of it being like an intense five days, it was just, you know, everyone had an assignment every week. It was literally, OK, go go edit your chapter and submit it. Right. Like, don't apologize for editing, whatever. Just just, uh, you know, like do it and. We it went through you know eight pairs of eyes and at the end um, you you had something. Uh, I think the only chapter we had to rewrite was the final one, and that was to that like it didn't sound great, and I think we kind of knew it, and we we ran like a mini version of that process for the final chapter, and and it sounded much better afterwards. And after all the, all of that, I think we published it 20, like November of twenty twenty, and. It, so so how long was it in total to 
I, I, it was a it was a few months, okay. like three or four months or something like. That. I mean that's that's amazing. I uh -huh. with uh, I did a similar process. Uh -huh. We've had a book published back uh -huh. in two thousand one called Four Souls. Uh -huh. It was about an adventure around the world I uh -huh. did with three college uh -huh. Uh, uh -huh. friends and. Uh -huh. And we wrote it kind of uh -huh. like that, but uh -huh. it took, we moved to Big Bear. We lived in a cabin uh -huh. up there. We'd snowboard uh -huh. during uh -huh. the day and write at night. And, mm. but it was, we'd yeah. write these chapters and we wound up with like this thousand page book and uh, then we yeah. had the, yeah. So it sounds like you were much more organized. Well, than, we, uh, we, we were, we were brutal, right? Like, so towards the end there, what we did was we, we verbally read through every paragraph. And uh, we we had it all in a Google Doc, so we could all like highlight stuff or whatever. And like as we're reading it, like people would highlight stuff. Okay, this sounds awkward. This doesn't sound good. This would, but, and and we would like be brutal with that one paragraph. And we cut out so much stuff. Like just there there was way more written than what ended yeah. up in the in the book. Um, and uh, and was, yeah, was it easy? Did people usually agree, or was there like intense discussions? Like, I mean, no, that needs to stay. Well, so part part of the process that I think really helped was at the beginning we identified the audience and the review we wanted, and by doing that, like we had kind of a north star, right? Like this is what we're trying to accomplish, and we had an objective standard by which we can evaluate everything. It was, does this get them there or not? Yeah. If it doesn't, we need to cut it out. It's it's not really going to help them in anything. And if it does, then we have to keep it because it's going to help them to understand what this is. So um, it became, and plus like by by the time like it, it had gotten to that point, like you had no idea who wrote what sentence, right? It was, it was just sort of like munched over and over again. It might've been germinated from one person's idea, but like morphed many, many times. So. Uh, you know, it, it, it was nice because there wasn't really that much ego involved in it. I mean, there's still a little ego, right? Like, but in, in the end, like we, what, when we were finished, we're like, okay, yeah, this, this is good. I, I, I think this will hit the mark and, you know, um, and it's probably one of the, one of the best selling books that I've had, uh, for sure. And that, um, and yeah, we we had a fantastic reception. A lot of people bought it. I mean, there. I, I, I mean, I still give it to people. I, yeah. I recommend it to them. I, and I and I came to it skeptically because uh -huh. a lot of times you read like <laughs> Christian books where they take on another subject and it's yeah, yeah. not done that well. But I read that. I was like, wow, they actually like nailed this. Yeah, so it was, yeah. It, it it was um it was definitely a labor of love, and we we put a lot into it. Um and. I think one of, one of the books that really resonated with me during the process or early on in the process, um, I was recommended a book by Joel Salatin. And uh, if you don't know who he is, he's, yeah. he's, a, he's like, um, he's a regenerative farmer from Virginia. Okay. And he wrote, he's written lots and lots of books, very libertarian, everything I wanna do is illegal, all right? Like, uh, you know, talking about like government regulation and stuff like that. But the the one book that he's he's written as a Christian, he's a very faithful Christian, is The Marvelous Pigness of Pigs. And somebody told me about that book. So I got it immediately. I started reading it. And wow, it blew my mind because this is this guy is a farmer, but he's also a Christian. And he explains exactly how his faith comes through in his farming, which you would never expect, right? But he goes through, he's like, okay, like. You have to understand what a farmer does. And a good farmer gets the most out of his animals, right? Like he, he makes a pig more a pig, right? The marvelous pigness of a pig. He has a pig express his pigness. Whereas like commercial pig farming is going in the opposite direction. And he's saying, this is what God intended, is for a pig to fully express its pigness. And that's what a farmer is able to do. That is what man is able to do. This is why God put Adam and Eve in the garden, because they add something to nature. And I was like, I mean, like even just hearing that, it's yeah. just like, okay, you get a sense of how this profession is very biblical and under understanding God's will around all of that. And I, and I read that and I was like, oh my goodness, we need to do the same thing with with this topic. And we we need to we need to explain it with this level of clarity. Otherwise, like people are not gonna get it or whatever. Um, and that, that, that for me was an inspiration because he brought something that no preacher could bring because he has experience as a farmer. 
And we wanted to bring something that no other, no preacher could bring because we, we understand money and economics and most preachers don't. And that, that, that was the aim. And yeah, uh, it, it worked out pretty good, I think. So has the, the audience that has been most interested in it mm -hmm. been what you expected or have you seen, like, have you seen this is something that you can give to a pastor that knows nothing about Bitcoin <laughs> or is it mostly Bitcoiners being introduced to, to, to faith? Well, so it's a, it's a kind of a strange mix. So we definitely had, we, we aimed it when, when we did the audience exercise, we were like, okay, like most of us had Christians in mind, right? Like whether it's like someone at our church or whatever, and we would describe them. It's like, okay, it's like Sunday church goer, been, been, you know, faithful for this many years, whatever. That, that was mostly what we had in mind. So we, we aimed it at Christians, which is why we don't mention the word Bitcoin until chapter eight, right? Like first seven chapters, it's just, here's how fiat is, has made things horrible. Yeah. And here's how like Bitcoin changes the equation and how, how we can return to a more biblical money. Um, so we expected that and we did get a lot of reaction like that. So, um, like, Julia, who's one of my co-authors, uh, gave that book to her sister. She's been trying to orange pill her sister for like six years at that point. Didn't buy Bitcoin at all. She read the book and she was like, I get it. And she bought some Bitcoin, right? Like that, that's, that's how you know, okay, like this is hitting at a di yeah. different level. So we, we had a lot of reactions like that. But strangely, we also had a lot of other people that we didn't expect get into it. So a lot of Bitcoiners did read the book. They were like, okay, yeah, I need to sell my Dogecoin, right? Like that, that was like a common reaction. It's like, okay, I, they, they started understanding what money was about and, uh, and really started getting uh, an understanding of that. Uh, but there were, there were also other people that I completely didn't expect, right? Like Safety Namus, Muslim. He asked for a copy of the book. I was like, yeah, sure, here. <laughs> and he wanted to talk about it because, you know, the moral aspect of it also applies to Muslim people. And he wanted to make that clear. And, you know, since then, I think there are, there's a whole Muslim community of Bitcoiners that are arguing that it's, uh, you know, it's, uh, I guess, halal and not haram or something like that. But... You know, that, that's definitely not something I expected. Um, uh, but yeah, the, the part that I guess surprised me a little bit was uh, the, the reaction of a lot of Bitcoiners that had sort of like been led away from faith. Yeah. And they, they read the book and they're like, you know, I started going back to church again. And, uh, and that I attribute to, okay, yeah, they're, they're realizing that these two things are in alignment. And, uh, you know, Part of what attracted them to Bitcoin was that sort of like pursuit of truth and the 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 like more the greater um, you know the the their better selves right uh, like not the not the worse the the devil on your shoulder is telling you to trade and like FOMO and go buy Lambos and whatever uh, but the the better the angel on your shoulder is like thinking about sound money and better incentives and civilizations and saving and like long-term time perspective, low time preference behavior and stuff like that. They realized that's, that's, that's Christianity. Yeah. And they, they started going back to church. They started, you know, um, you know I, I, I still get at every conference, somebody that tells me, okay, Jimmy read the book. I started going to church again. You know, I'm getting baptized next week or something like that. And it's, uh, it's always just sort of like, I did not expect that out of this book. Well, there's no greater low time preference than yeah, thinking yeah. about eternity. Yeah. And so yeah. I think that it brings people back to just seeing the importance of justice for mm -hmm. God. God mm -hmm. wants justice in this world, even though it's a fallen world, mm -hmm. we're to strive for that. So yeah. yeah. And and that was uh that was pretty gratifying to to hear and 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 still hear. And you know, to this day, you know, like uh, the there, there are people that'll tell me like I, I, I bought like thirty copies of your book and started handing it out to everyone at my church. I'm like, okay, I hope they read it. You know, like it's, uh, but it's, it's been, it's definitely not been something I expected. Yeah, uh, and and you've written 
Mm -hmm. How many books have you written since then? Uh, uh, well, so that was book number three. Okay, that and, was three. Okay. And that uh, book number four was Bitcoin and the American Dream, and book number five is the more recent one, Fiat Ruins. Yeah, everything. you gave me a copy yeah, of that. Yeah, I yeah. haven't had a chance to dive into it yet, <laughs> but I'm looking forward to it. I think um, you'll appreciate it. There's there's definitely some chapters that have a very Christian theme. So uh, Fiat Ruins Charity is one, yeah. and, uh, and I, I think you'll really enjoy that chapter. <laughs> well, what drives you to, to write books? Because I know mm -hmm. it's not the money. The, the <laughs> writing books, people think that there's money in it, but there's there's really not. No, uh, no. Not, so. not anymore. Not unless like you're a top-selling, best-selling author yeah. and you sell... You like, sell a million plus yeah, yeah. books. To yeah, I mean, it's, it's really more a marketing play for most people. Uh, I mean, I... Um, I like writing, uh, and which is a little weird because I, I hated English class when, <laughs> when I was growing up. I got the worst grades in all of my English classes for most of my uh, childhood. Uh, but uh, so there you go, Mrs. Terrace. I, 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 I <laughs> worst teacher ever. But <laughs> I, I've written books to prove you wrong. Uh, but yeah, I mean, part part of it is is wanting to express my thoughts and um you know i do it i guess partly for me because you know there by writing you have to like congeal your thoughts right you can't just sort of keep them vague in your mind um and this is this is something that i always appreciated about mathematics is when you're writing a proof down like every step gets scrutinized so like you really have to write it down and and like that that act of writing down some something happens in between there where um an understanding takes place like a much deeper one and i i find that with writing as well when you when it's sort of like a vague conception in your mind it's one thing but when you speak it it gets clearer but when you write it down it gets yeah. really clear um so I part of that I do it for me. Um, the other part is, you know, I, I I want more people to get into Bitcoin, or in the case of this last book, I want Bitcoiners to understand just like what we're fighting against. Um, so that that part's important for me uh, to sort of contribute something back to the community. I mean, like that said, like there's like so many books now, and it's it's easier than ever to get something published. Uh, so I, I don't know, maybe, maybe maybe at this point, it's like sort of like an exercise in vanity, but uh, I, I, I like writing books and, uh, you know, my my audience uh, seems to like it. Um, and so it's, it's a good way for me to clarify what I'm thinking so I could be more articulate about it on shows like this. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. So. Tell us about the program this summer. <laughs> when I heard that you were going to be involved, I was super excited because uh -huh. one of the things that I've seen here in El Salvador as they've embraced Bitcoin as legal tender, as all these companies are flowing in, mm -hmm. there really is a dearth of technical talent here because before yeah. there just wasn't jobs. And mm -hmm. so you have all these companies flowing in and uh -huh. they want to hire people. Uh -huh. But a lot of them are having trouble finding the right people for those jobs. So mm -hmm. when I heard about this program with Kubo Plus that, uh -huh. that Stacy was has mm -hmm. been really championing. Um, I was like, okay, this is what we need. <laughs> and then to see somebody like you come down and then spend some time participating. So what, tell me from your perspective, what you see of the value of that program mm -hmm. and, and kind of what your perception was coming into it and then leaving what it's different and what you think El Salvador needs. Yeah. So uh, the, the whole thing started not this summer, but last summer. Um, and Stacy was pitching me on like, okay, we, we really like, we don't have developers. And um, I had met with uh, some people on the prior time that I came down. And she was like, we, we, we need to get more developers in El Salvador. Uh, so I was like, okay, well, I'm, I'm, I'm game to try it. Um, but you know, like the hard part is getting people to apply for a scholarship. Scholarships are easy to go get sponsored, like lot, lots of people, but you know, finding people is going to be hard. She's like, well, let me try it. So she put out a call and we got a bunch of applications, um, ended up teaching a cohort of five or six. And this, this was sort of like a preliminary thing, very sort of like ad hoc and we we just sort of did it last summer and we taught them it worked out and uh you know we we talked about it to uh ibrahim uh bukeli uh, uh naib's brother 
And, you know, they, they were super excited about, okay, like, can we do this on a larger scale so we can develop this? So, so I think that's where it sort of like germinated this idea of training developers in El Salvador. Well, what, what can you do? How do you identify talent and how do you, how do you train them up to, to get to that point? Um, and, and then like Stacy took it sort of like to another level. She, she found sponsors for this, I think, um, you know, iFinex and uh, Tether are big sponsors of this stuff. Uh, found found a lot of the right people, uh, and you know, they they asked me to do sort of the intense coding course again. It's a it's a very intense course, by the way. It's uh, two days, eight hours each day, and it's uh, it's a lot of like live coding which and didn't people have to like they started with a bigger group and yeah. they, they had the they picked the top people and they pared it down to yeah the, so they 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 pared it down during the cohort and uh and by the time it got to me it was just 12 people that i taught this summer and the idea was okay like the best the best of the best kept get to kind of graduate to the next level and do do uh do more they even took it further like a, a little earlier when they uh took some of the students and brought them all the way to Lugano. And I talked yeah, to them. Yeah, like, I saw a number of them there. That was awesome. And, and, which, which is crazy. But that, that, that was the idea was to sort of like keep, keep whittling uh, and, you know, train them. And, you know, uh, it's hard to say what the dividends are at this point. But, you know, I, I know those, those uh, students that I taught are pretty good. You know, they, they managed to do it. And, you know they they have talent you have human capital here yeah. it's a uh, but you know discovering it surfacing it you know training it and you know get getting getting them you know appropriate sort of like work and stuff um i mean from what i heard from giacomo earlier today uh like i think most of them have some some role in the industry already um and yeah, it's a, it's a matter of uh sort of doing that again and think they're going to go a little wider uh, in this next cohort, uh, not just developers, but also like merchants and teach all of them everything uh, instead of just like developers. Uh, and, you know, the, the hope is to have me come back here in about a year and do another cohort, uh, maybe slightly bigger, um, maybe a lot of these <laughs> uh students can go tell other people this is an awesome program right like you're i mean they got fed steak every night <laughs> like got to stay like they 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 traveled to switzerland and like you know did did, did all this other stuff i mean it's it's a pretty cool program and I, I was suggesting that it get named like the presidential scholarship program or something i, I don't know if they have ended up doing that but but that that that's where you want to yeah. be is uh is have sort of like this elite stuff and then offer offer some of that uh these uh these you know fantastic coders to the right companies um, well i think it's just crucial to have those first cohorts because uh -huh. that's the the biggest thing is a lot of these kids are like interested they're motivated uh -huh. but they don't know what to do they're like yeah. okay what's the next step and yeah. there wasn't a lot of people that have gone before them that they could model after yeah so now they have this first cohort and maybe it's not a huge cohort but that will multiply out where 10 years from now just a huge impact i think there's going to be a ton of developer talent in this country basically going from like mm -hmm. zero to a hundred over a short period of time, kind of like you've seen with the construction and everything else <laughs> going on in El Salvador. I think there's that same potential, but mm -hmm. having people get that started, that momentum, it's that first group yeah. that it's the hardest part. So super, th super thankful to you to well, I, I come mean, down I, and do that. I, I honestly, like I, I'm a capitalist there. Like it's, it's not like I'm not getting paid, Mike. So it's, a, a, you know, I'm not doing this out of the goodness of my heart. Well, you know, obviously that's, a, that's a part of it. Uh, what, what, what's striking to me is that like out of that very first cohort, the six or seven that I taught last summer, uh, one of them was uh, sort of like the mentor to everybody else in this cohort of okay. 12. Um, another one was actually like anti Bukele, but then like, they flipped a little bit after that or something like that. Uh, you know, several, several others, uh, I think, ended up, you know, doing the work for Bitcoin stuff. So, um, you know, even, even that, even from a year ago, there, there, there's some evidence that this is, this is actually, you know, starting to work. And, Certainly, uh, you know, with the with uh, 
yeah, the momentum behind this next cohort. Um, it should be significantly bigger, and they're 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 dreaming pretty big, um, from what I hear. And you know, um, I I hope to come back and teach a bunch of them and um, and get them like really ready to go do work at a lot of these companies. And yeah, I mean, there there can be good jobs here. Um, there's a lot of companies coming in, and yeah. it's just a matter of filling demand. So yeah. well, and even in this day too, a lot of times you know the positions are remote, so but they yeah. can. <laughs> it used to be they had to leave El Salvador to uh -huh. you know earn a U.S. wage, where now. Mm -hmm. You know, I know people here that mm -hmm. they can live in this paradise and, mm -hmm. and still be earning a higher wage. So, well, I and I I hope that happens. I really hope that there's a, a sort of like a, like a wage increase because uh, you know the more I learn about like what's happened politically, um, well, really international politics, not not like even the local stuff uh, with the IMF and stuff like that. The more I'm realizing, like the, this country was kept poor for a while um, through the machinations of, uh, you know, IMF loans and things like that. Uh, now that they're sort of like free from those shackles, you can you can see, you know, um, the the prosperity that's that's blooming. And yeah, you know, it wouldn't surprise me to see this place become a little bit more like Singapore, which was uh, like. In the fifties, it was a downtrodden. Yeah, it was a like, backwater. Yeah, backwater. Now, now it's like a global hub, like super nice and like lots of talent flowing there and stuff like that. I mean, th this this place could be the twenty first century Singapore. Well, it's crazy, even with all this growth, because when it, when mm -hmm. I first started seeing all these things happen, I was like, Are this <laughs> borrowing a bunch of money and going into uh -huh. debt, but. There's been a number of even mm. like the big banks that were like anti Bitcoin adoption mm. have come in and looked at their finances are like, no, actually, they're being much more responsible yeah. than the past. Mm -hmm. There's less of a deficit. And I think even on the, the I think they have like a zero current account deficit. Mm -hmm. um, which is great, right? Is, like they're, yeah. they're, they're, and, they're and they're building getting, at the same time. Like yeah, they're, getting rid of yeah. debt, like saving and doing, and you know, like I, I know El Salvador has some Bitcoin on its balance sheet. And, you know, next bull market. Like, yeah. it's very conceivable that like they won't have to think about the IMF ever again. And one, if if other countries see that this is a viable model, and I got to tell you, Mike, I, I've been, you know, I, I traveled the world with my family this past year. Almost everybody in all of these Bitcoin communities asked about El Salvador. It's like, have you been there? I'm like, yeah, I've been there a few times. And they're like, well, so what do you think? Like, can, can our country do this? Cause then, like that, that, that's like the first question, right? Yeah. Like I was in Georgia and their similar population, I think, uh, you know, 5 million to 10 million, somewhere around there. Um, you know, smallish country, you know, there, there's a giant country right next door or whatever. And they're like, you know, can't we do this? Like what, like what, what, are, like how, how do we take that model and bring it over here? Um, that, that's a, that's a very common question. And I think for a lot of these smaller countries, this is, this is something that they're, they're looking very closely at this project because they, they want the same sort of like, level of freedom, uh, like from the international monetary order. Uh, and, and I think all of them realize it because yeah. almost every country where I go, where it's kind of small, they, they've gone through multiple currency devaluations and things like that, but they're, where they're like, yeah, and you know, my parents lost 70% of their savings in one day or whatever. It's such a common thing. Uh, they're they're kind of used to it, but they're like, okay, can can there be a different way? Um, and th this is why a lot of them are into Bitcoin, and they're they're hoping that their country is next. Well, I, I do think, and you know, I'm not, not one to focus on price, but I mm -hmm. do think in the next upcycle, mm -hmm. you're going to see more countries come in. I think they've mm -hmm. been watching, waiting, mm -hmm. seeing, and and watching. I, I've been very impressed with how mm -hmm. the, the country has handled this down market. Mm -hmm. They've just doubled down. They haven't mm -hmm. backed away from it. They're like, hey, we have a long-term perspective on this. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think they've set the example for other countries. So I, I think in this next cycle, we'll see a few more countries uh, adopt. Yeah, I hope so. And the, the, the interesting thing is it's like unlocked a lot of different things. So like the volcano project is absolutely fascinating to me because it's a long term capital project. It's uh, you don't you don't get a single, you know, watt of electricity for like four years. Right. And you, you have to build all of this infrastructure. You have to drill and you have to 
put in, but once you build it, it's like available for 90 years or something like that. Like it's it's so good for an economy to have like steady electricity. We were, we were looking at like the flickering lights yeah. uh, earlier today. But if you have like steady energy, I, that that's a massive boon to to an economy because now now you can run factories and uh, and do things uh, without needing to pay for a generator and you you have like good power. Um, you know, I, I'm hoping they use a lot more fossil fuels here to. And you know, I really wish they there there would be like more scooters and stuff. This is something that I've noticed about Southeast Asia that I I haven't seen here. Everybody owns a scooter, and those scooters are like five hundred dollars. Which I think people here yeah. can afford. No, you've right? seen that recently. Mm-hmm. In fact, I was mm-hmm. we're, as we're doing a construction mm-hmm. project here. Mm-hmm. I feel like every couple of months the number of scooters I see yeah. doubles because as they're making decent wages and now yeah. they're able to afford and buy these. But, so but it's, it's not so not awesome just afford see. it, but it, it 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 gives you the ability to do different kinds oh, yeah. of work, right? And you can. And they're very innovative about not wasting that. all your time on the bus every yeah, day. Yeah, I mean, you you attach it to like uh, you know a, a four seater thing, and you now have a tuk tuk. Now you can like transport large items on it instead of a truck, and you can you can make do until yeah. like you know you you have more prosperity and so on. But it's it, this is how a lot of these countries grow. Is you need sort of that entrepreneurial energy at the grassroots level, and and you you. Kind of seeing that here, which is which is wonderful, um, and I, I I'd love to see more of that sort of unleashed around the world, and that's that's like the hope that we have with Bitcoin is that it it can get you from out from under the fiat system, and the fiat system is horribly oppressive, and it's uh, it's unfortunate, but that's uh, that's the only system that a lot of people know. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's why I'm so excited about what we're doing here this week uh-huh, uh-huh. And, and this new project that we're looking at with mm-hmm. Gresham Ventures and kind of bringing together, you know, the faith based mm-hmm. um, world with economic development and using mm-hmm. Bitcoin in that. So I think there's a couple of the other authors from Thank mm-hmm. God from Bitcoin that are yeah. here, Jordan and Gabe. Is there mm-hmm. anybody else? Am no, missing? those two. Okay. Yeah. So just to be able to see like mm-hmm. how these things come together and like we've seen here in El Sante, the mm-hmm. way that people's lives have improved, that people no longer have to leave to go to the U.S. Mm-hmm. illegally. You see mm-hmm. families staying together where before they were breaking apart. You know, it's mm-hmm. it's not good for a marriage when, you know, the spouse is gone for, you know, 10 years. Mm-hmm. That doesn't lead to healthy marriages. Mm-hmm. So it's just so great to see all these things come together. And yeah, I'm excited I'm, you're here. Yeah, you know, well, I, I, I'm excited about this uh Sort of like rethinking a lot of missions and stuff like that. I mean, I, you know, I, I didn't write a chapter in the book about this, but I think fiat's ruined missions. Oh, 100%. Yeah. Uh, so many projects create yeah. dependency yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and actually do damage. It's, uh-huh. it's good hearted people that uh-huh. love them and they're trying to help, but. Uh-huh. Because of the way the fiat system works, it creates mm-hmm. dependency and it it actually does more damage than good. Yeah, and and so much of missions has been mixed with charity, right? Like where where you're really supporting their economic needs <laughs> more than anything else. Used to be that you went in to take care of their spiritual needs, right? Like this 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 was sort of like the the model for all of the apostles that went went out from Jerusalem, you know, they would go to another city and wasn't they weren't going there to like feed them. They were going there to say, "Hey, Jesus is Lord and you need to listen to this stuff." And that that that's that's a very different message than okay, we're going to feed you and by the way, you should believe in Jesus, yeah. right? Like that that's a, that's a, it's it seems like the food comes with strings attached or you know the housing comes with or the well comes with strings attached and there that that sort of like economic disparity is has been a feature of the fiat world for a long time and that's something that a lot of missionaries have had to deal with was and, and I, I'm sure you know this better than me, but every missionary like talks about like the scam that they had to fall for. Some guy coming in saying, "Oh, I believe in Jesus, but I need some money for this or whatever." And uh, and you know th- this this has become sort of like this common thing because the economic disparity forces sort of like this secondary need, uh, which which becomes primary rather than yeah. you know the thing that you're trying to do as a missionary. So. 
for me, the, the, this, is, this is a chance to think about what, what this new world of missions looks like under a Bitcoin standard and how it's going to operate. Because I, I don't think you get the, I, I heard a term today, the missions industrial complex, right? Like, I, I, you know, what, what happens when that, you know, sort of like that administrative overhead and all of this sort of like marketing and all that, like, what happens when those things are no longer as viable because you have more peer-to-peer -peer connections and a decentralized sort of like relationship-based yeah. uh, missions? How, how does that change everything? And, well, you know. obviously it makes it better. I, I think even people involved in that, I uh -huh. don't think it's usually that they have malintentions. Uh -huh. It's just that's the way the system's built. It's yeah. built to replicate the way everything happens, yeah. you know, just in business and, and everything else. Everything's very corporate and structured so well, and very centralized peer -peer, yeah. very very um you know dependent on scale to achieve things yep. rather than people right um, and one size fits all almost all across the board and you know like not having that much flexibility and uh, yeah i mean that that's such a like common big company large government kind of, th those are the problems that yeah. you get because of fiat money. And, Decentralization yeah. is yeah. so key to yeah. it. So, yeah. so I'm excited to see. Yeah, I, I, I would love to see more of that. And that was something that I was uh, telling everybody today is, you know, what what if, it, you know, like you actually had relationships with the, with the people that you're trying to support instead of like going through this intermediary, right? Like this uh, missions org, uh, you know, like, I, I don't know how many missionaries tell me, okay, well, you have to donate to my organization and they'll pay me. And so why can't I just give you money? What's, yeah. wrong, what's wrong with that? <laughs> but but that, 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 that's the way these kinds of, they have to operate partly. It's because like- A oh, lot of it's can, government regulation. You're right. It's, it's like, like anti-money and laundering laws, yeah. KYC stuff. That, and not just that, there's like tax deductions yeah. and stuff like that. I, I mean, I want to get away Move from away that. From yeah, that. right. It's just- Let's let's make it really charity, yeah, right? Like, like where 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 you're giving not because you're getting a tax deduction, but you're giving because you believe in the project and you have a relationship with somebody that's doing it, yeah. right? And and that that to me is what Christian charity should look like, where you know you're not just giving money away, you're 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 doing something with the person and. You're you're giving some of your effort and time as well, where and you know spiritual support. Um, you know we give a lot of lip service to the prayer part and stuff like that, but I, I think it would be very different if it operated similarly to what we read in the gospel or in uh, you know Paul's letters yeah. and so on, where you know people were constantly praying and you know like they were really invested in these projects in uh, all these different cities. I would love to see more of that come back. Um, and I think it can under a, a sound money without this sort of international monetary order that like uh, creates these arbitrary rules uh, that uh, that force people to, you know, uh, debase their ministry. Yeah, 100 percent. Yeah. Well, I uh, I won't keep you any longer. I know <laughs> it's uh, we've had a long day here already, but I want to make sure people know where they can get your books uh -huh. and then also are you still doing coding classes that people can can take and make sure they know about that yeah i mean i uh i i have another um class that i want to teach so not not the programming blockchain one but programming taproot which is uh which i debuted with the kubo plus students um so that'll probably be in january uh, my new book is called Fiat Ruins Everything, and uh, it's it's about how fiat ruins all kinds of stuff that you wouldn't think of, like families and morals and beliefs and you know uh, global politics and things like that. So um, that's available on Amazon at BitcoinMagazine.com. It's also on my website, FiatRuinsEverything.com. Um, see, yeah, I mean, there, there's there's probably other stuff that I have, but I'm, I'm good. <laughs> just promoting this. well i'll I'll just uh shill for people to make sure that if they read your books uh -huh. and enjoy it 
to write a review. I know uh, those are important for, for authors, for people mm -hmm. to know, even for their rankings on Amazon, that sort of thing. So if you love Jimmy's stuff, which I'm sure you will, I, I do. I mean, I'm a, I'm a pretty critical reader. So <laughs> uh, make sure you write a review for him and then they follow you on Twitter, obviously. Jimmy Song, yeah. Okay. Are you on Noster? Yeah. Okay. So, so um, yeah, that's a little harder to search. but <laughs> Well, I'm sure they can find you in that community there. So. Mm -hmm. Uh, appreciate you coming down this week, and uh, we got to get your family back here next time. Well, yeah, I think it's uh, I think it's time. It's uh, it, it's like nice and safe, and there's uh, there's enough like goods and services that where I think I could see myself like spending a month or two here with yeah. my family. Yeah. All right, well, let's make it happen. Then you got a studio uh, ready here for you to use, <laughs> and yeah, sounds good. All right, thanks, Jimmy. Thanks.